During the apartheid era, there was a rising uh, opposition and to the apartheid policy. And I was running a train ministry. I had about a thousand men uh, who we called field reps preaching on the way in. And they came to me, their representatives came to me one day and said, uh, Brother Bob, we have a problem that on such and such a day, I think it was a Wednesday, there's going to be a big meeting in Kwamashu and they're going to start burning. And by that they mean they're going to get tires and they burn uh, people. Generally, it was the Christians who got burnt with the tires because they wouldn't get involved in the violence in the political arena. And they were extremely concerned. And uh, the police and the army had surrounded Kwamashu so that nobody could come into the center of town and burn the town. That was the plan. And I'll tell you, the tension in the city was an all-time high because it could go either way. But I, that particular night, I had to speak at the Consumption, I think it was called, or some name like that, Roman Catholic Church along Fair Road or Bottle Road, wherever it is. And so I was there until about 9.30 that night. I left the place after I'd ministered, went home in Northridge House, got into bed. And as I was getting into bed, it was a voice or a a message or a, a knowledge said to me, you must go to Kwamashu. There will be people there for you to pray with. And I thought, that can't be true. No, Nobody's going to go to Kwamashu with all the tension and all the violence that's due to happen. And it's 9.30 at night. There's no, And I'll be the only white person there. There is no ways I'm going there. But the it was almost like it kept repeating this thinking. It, it was a compulsion, go. So I thought, what I decided to do, well, I'll get in the car, I'll get dressed again, and I'll go to Mschlonga, where there's a, a high-rise hill with all the new shopping complexes on a day, but that was just sugarcane in my day and park my car there, and I'll look over the area of Kwamashu, and I'll pray over it. And so I got, cha got redressed, and I made a lot of noise, hoping to wake Thelma, because if Thelma woke up, she'd tell me, don't go, don't be stupid, that's dangerous. But she didn't wake up, and she's a light sleeper, but she did not wake up. Anyway, I got in the car, and I remember clearly I reversed the car in the, in the court, courtyard and I remember going down our driveway. The next thing I can remember is I'm driving up the hill to the hall in Kwamashu and that's a good half an hour's road trip. But this all happened to me in a minute, in a second. It was like, as I drove up, I, I said to myself, how did you get here? How did you get here? Something unreal had happened. But when I got to the top of this hill, which I knew quite well because I'd been speaking there on and off for months, when I got to the top of the hill, there were about 40, 50 people all from the meeting place. And they were just standing there because they didn't know what to do. With that, the bottle store owner who was there, he was clearing out uh, his cash and all as much liquor as he could carry because whenever they go rioting they always go to the bottle store and break it up to get some drink so he was trying to protect his goods and then he came across and he offered us his loud speaking system that he used to have on his vehicle he said you can use that so the Africans the Zulus took it and this woman had a most powerful voice she starts in Zulu inviting people to come to the meeting. Now, it must be 10.30 at night. And guess what? Doors opened and a few people came and a few more and suddenly we got a couple of hundred people. The hall is locked. We can't get into the hall. 
uh, the bottle store owner is gone, and so what did I do? I sat on the bonnet of my car, and I, I started talking to them. I said, the Bible says, once you come into the kingdom of God, you do not get entangled with the affairs of this world. Don't get involved with the politics. Don't get involved in the violence. Try and stay clear of all that because you are basically Christians. Well, with that, I, I suddenly recall uh, seeing the sun just beginning. It was just going from dark to light. And I realized, you better get out of here. You're the only white skin around and you'll get killed. So I got in the car and I told them I go. And I, in those days I had a Jaguar, boy. I'll tell you, that Jaguar sped down that road like you've got to imagine. I was out of there. I was scared. And, and I got out of the road and I, I came into the, the main road and there was a military post, sandbags the lot, but manned by police. And a guy jumped out, and I presumed I'd been caught for speeding. And that was true, and I, and I was quite happy. I would pay for the speeding fine. Instead of that, he yanked me out the car and wanted to know what I'd been doing in there. So I told him what I'd been doing, uh, encouraging people and uh, to stay with the Lord and not get involved with all the politics and what have you. Well, he just shoved me into this little hut thing they had there, in fact, he gave me a real smart clout on the side of my face, which hurt like anything. My ears were ringing. But one fellow there said, uh, I know Mr. Trench. I know him quite well, he said, and um, I think we better be careful about this. Then the officer came, and the officer asked the same sort of questions, which I couldn't explain. How did you get in to Kwamashu? When did you go in? I said, I went in, must have been 10, 11, I don't know. I'm not looking at my watch, but I only went in tonight. Impossible, they said. We've had this place covered from early yesterday morning. Nobody comes in and out. You're lying. Tell us how you got in. I said, well, you can phone them, the priest at the Consumption Church. I was there at 9.30 last night, and there was a congregation that can all vouch for that now. But, and he was a Roman Catholic, so that put him under a spot. So the big discussion took place, and eventually, eventually, about 8 o'clock that morning, they let me go and said to me, don't you leave your house. Go straight home and don't you dare leave your house. But the funny thing is, at 8.30, uh, the atmosphere relaxed because they were expecting hordes of the Zulus to come down the street, and it didn't happen. The sergeant major or whatever, the officer, whatever he was, came to my office three and four times to find out, please tell me how you got into Kwamashu. We had every road covered. We had every side road covered. We had every... How did you get in? I said to him, I don't know. What I know is I drove out my driveway and all I can remember is driving up the hill. There's a half hour period that I should have been driving, I know nothing about. I can't explain it. I don't know what happened, but I, what I do know is I drove down the driveway and I drove up the hill. Oh, about uh, three or four months later, I found out what happened. It was quite amazing. After I left, this woman that had this big thing, she decided they go down to the Ndaba, the meeting, and the stadium. That that's where all those who are against apartheid and against segregation and all those sort of things would meet. And they marched down singing Christian songs and inviting people to join them. So they all joined and about, they say about five, six hundred people took the front seats in the stadium. When they came, the, um, the leaders who were putting this up there, putting the strike on, came. They invited the people to come up and air their grievances. The idea being that the people will help stir up all the animosity. But what he didn't know was the first 500-odd people were Christians. 
And they all got up and spoke about the Lord, how the Lord had changed their lives, how that they were new creatures, how that they were forgiving the whites and how this was happening and that was happening and the whole thing fizzled out. And I honestly believe that if all that hadn't happened, there would have been bloodshed. I mean, the tension up until then had been so great and they, were, they, they felt they had to do something. But it was the Christian witness that changed that. And that the thing that troubled me for a long time, am I losing my mind that I was here and in one second I'm there? Now, I know in the Bible it says that you could get translated. You can go from one place to another. But here I am in a motor car. Did God translate me, car and all, and put me there? Uh, it is, I've tried to reason it out. There's no ways you could fall asleep and drive for 30 minutes or 35 minutes. You can't do that. So how did I get there? It is still in a way, unexplained, inexplicable, unless you say to yourself, well, I must have been translated. And that's the only logical conclusion I've ever been able to come to. And people say, well, what was it like? I don't know what it was like, because I didn't know it happened, but it happened. All I know is I was here, and I blinked, and I was there. How? I don't know. Uh, somebody said, oh, you must have known a secret way in. Well, if you know the area of Kwamashu, it's quite hilly and it's rough and it's rocky. And a Jaguar is a very low car, right down on the road. So even if I had known a special way in, the car, that car could not have made it, no ways. So my explanation or my understanding, I leave it in God's hands. If somebody says to me, were you translated? I don't know. If somebody says to me, uh, how do you explain it? I really don't know. But I've, over the meditating it many, many times, the only conclusion is that God had those people gather on that hill for some purpose, that here I come, and he wanted me there. That's the only thing I can explain. And when I got there, how did I suddenly find that scripture? That he that knows the Lord doesn't get entangled with the affairs of this world. I mean, it's not a scripture I'd ever used and I'd ever thought about. And it just rolled out. Then when I left, she goes down through the streets calling people to join them and they sat in the front. The shock, Mr. Butelezi, one of the brothers to the present um, chap in Zuland, told me, he said it was, he was there. He said it was the most inspiring thing he ever saw. He said person after person after person spoke about Jesus. Person after person spoke about Jesus. He said it was almost like an evangelical outreach. He said and the leadership that were there to stir the people up, get all the hatred going, they, they were powerless because they invited the people up and the lines of people waiting to get to the mic were there. And they couldn't believe it, Christian after Christian after Christian. And I will believe that one day when we, the Lord will show me how he did that and what it was all about.